Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, High Resolution Imaging of Zebrafish at Nano and Millimeter Scale. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Andor. To learn more, visit andor.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Dr. Julian Resigir, Postdoctoral Fellow, University of Oslo, and Dr. Claudia Florindo, Product Specialist, Life Sciences and or Technology. Dr. Resigir, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the very kind introduction. So good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. And I will uh, present you uh, my work on high resolution imaging of zebrafish at nano on millimeter scales. So just a few words about me first. So I'm a postdoctoral fellow for the University of Oslo for the group of Professor Garrett Griffiths, for whom I conduct two uh, research topics, one on the behavior of therapeutic nanoparticles, on the interaction with the vasculature, and especially how they accumulate in disease related to angiogenesis. And also the second topic is more to the characterization of the structural organization of fish because of immunity with a special focus on the gill associated lymphoid tissue. So now we can start. So basically uh, in those recent years, there have been many advances in imaging whether it is a new kind of microscopes, such as the light sheets, or great improvements of the Comprocon microscopes as a conventional or spinning disk, they also benefited from a lot of improvements from the cameras that allowed us to acquire data at much higher resolutions and sensitivity. And of course, when you have so much imaging data, you also need improvements of the software. So all these improvements uh, allowed us now scientists to replace the molecular biology data into the special context. But the thing is, uh, a lot of the imaging advances benefited a lot the in vitro studies, as you can see with this very nice uh, picture of the future with the dragonfly. The problem is, in some fields, there is some kind of a gap between the in vitro studies on the next step, the in vivo. And there is a current need to strengthen this bridge especially for fields such as nanotechnology and vascular biology, which are complex, um, that, um, are about complex 3D structures and environment. And we think that one of the problems with these situations is, well, the MOS model is the most prominent model used at the moment by the scientists. But it shows several limitations for imaging. And we just go past all the practicability things. Uh, Still, those people have been able to have very nice uh, live imaging in mice with intractable imaging. However, the problem is this is a very invasive method. So either you just induce inflammatory conditions into your experiment, or you have to put anti-inflammatory drugs. And still, with that, it remains difficult to secure at the same time a very nice high spatial on time resolution. So basically. Uh, we have these situations when most people look into in vitro studies on cells and directly switch to in vivo in mammalian systems. And we think that uh, a lot of research would benefit by adding an intermediary model to the mammalian systems or to use a complementary model to them. And we think that one of the scientific model, animal model that uh, is on the rise at the moment and that benefits a lot from all these advances for imaging is the zebrafish. While it's highly available, accessible, it is incredibly practical because of its small size. And as you can see to the right here, the larvae of the zebrafish are fully developed by the tree, but also they are transparent when you add small drugs. Uh, there's a lot of tools that have been developed and it is uh, ethically more accepted than mammalian systems. But it's not just about practicability. Um, the zebrafish is 
like show high degree of conservations with mammals. 70% of human genes have an ontolog in zebrafish. It has a complex immune system, sensitive to toxicity. So actually a lot of people start to use the zebrafish model uh, for genetics, developmental studies, neurosciences. At the moment, what is put on the rise is human disease models for infections, cancers, or other biological mechanisms. But I think that what makes this model the most appealing at the moment on why the community using zebrafish grow and grow is because of two parameters. It allows, it's very good for live imaging on world organism observations. And the reason why is those two things has everything to do with preservation of the biological context. When you want to address complex scientific questions, you want to have the perfect and most optimal biological context. For light imaging, you don't have fixation artifacts. You can observe life, what is happening. You can see the cell moving, what it does. And if you go for world organism observations, you don't need to dissect things, so you don't do any damage. You can keep all the connections between the organs. If you want to study systemic tissues, vascular, lymphatic systems, nervous system, or even bones, it's very good. And also, to be able to check on the world organism level, is that allows you, that gives you the opportunity to explore other organs. Like, okay, I want to study the liver, but maybe I would find something unexpected in the organ nearby, in the kidney, for example. You don't know, but this actually allows you to do it. So, if you go a bit more into the live imaging now, um, so it said it's the zebrafish is heavily used for drug screenings, for cancer fields. For example, a group in Portugal by the professor Ritafio is injecting um, cancer cells from patients into the zebrafish larvae, and then she evaluates how they respond to drugs, to chemotherapeutic agents. There's a lot of people working uh, to study host pathogen interactions on virus, for example with uh, chikungunya virus, and even now there is preprint about the coronavirus. So by the group of Irene Sadinas, Pierre Goudineau, and Jean-Pierre Lebrot. Uh, there is a laboratory in Netherlands uh, by Maria Follenza, led by Maria Follenza, that uh, study uh, trypanosome, sitting sickness in the zebrafish, and then she can actually uh, study how they, they behave in the blood and infiltrate the tissues. Um, in our case, uh, we use the zebrafish also to study bacterial infections. We have model of tuberculosis. So if I were to slightly present, so here you have a zebrafish larvae. So we have the head right here on the tail to the right. You can inject uh, the equivalent of the tuberculosis bacteria of fish, which is called Mycobacterium marinum, into the spinal cord, called neural tube at this stage. And see this very thick granuloma in black. And if you were to stand the bacteria here in um, green or magenta, you see that this area is full of bacteria. On the nice thing with the dragon price, so one thing is most of the data I will present you today, the very huge majority comes from the, the Dragonfly 500, like this video right here. So we have fish where the neutrophils are green fluorescent and the macrophages are red fluorescent. And then you could acquire the whole volume of the granuloma, and then you could follow the behavior of the cells. And you see that there is one ear that at one point the macrophage in red will eat a neutrophil, and its cytosol will turn yellow, and then it will die. So you see, it starts to be yellow. And then up, it will pop out and die very quickly. There. So that's the advantages of the zebrafish, but it's also very good for other fields like uh, nanoparticle studies. Here, um, we, it's the video that, where we used uh, fluorescent uh, nanoparticles from the laboratory of Matthias Bart in the Netherlands. So basically, you have very tiny um, nanoparticles, either round or warm like, and they're incredibly fluorescent. So here, will be able actually to see videos like you can't see the particles but you see that all the fluorescence in white is from the particles and the nice thing is that it reveals negative all the red blood cells and if you wonder what all these black things are in the red blood cells uh, in fish um, red blood cells are nucleated as is the case for uh, some camel species so just let me enjoy a bit uh, when you push the dragonfly to its limits on bit acquisitions how good is the imaging? You can see the red blood cells are bending and bumping into each other. So I just find it very nice.
Anyway, if we continue a bit, um, I will now present you uh, a bit more like how we could use the zebrafish model uh, to actually make some findings on the nanoparticle seeds and to actually find uh, a new mechanisms at play that actually interact or actually alter the fate of intravenously injected nanoparticles. So it all starts uh, with the Dr. Bernard Verrier in France on his group in the CNRS on its associated uh, startup called Adjuvetis. So what they're doing is basically they created uh, what's called safe by design polymeric nanoparticles. Just to be quick, it's just nanoparticles that are made in a way, uh, in a proactive way to prevent any issues with human health. So for example, they're just made of plain PLA. There is no surfactant. And also all the residual solvents are in accordance with the European Pharmacopeia. They have a very small size, 200 nanometers, and they are highly stable. And the thing with this particle is they are biodegradable, biocompatible, and bioresorbable. And if we had to look at that nice nanoparticle, but what does it look? So basically those particles, they are made of interlacing polymer chains, as you can see in these artistic visions. But if we look uh, by electron microscopy technique, so here in scanning electron microscopy and in those two images with negative stain by transmission electron microscopy, they just look like some uh, very tiny ovoid beads. And as you can see to the right, this black dots are actually because in those particles we encapsulated smaller nanoparticles made of gold, which are dense to the electrons. Because that's one thing which is very interesting with nanoparticles is that you can trap compounds in the matrix of the nanoparticles. For example, drugs, adjuvants, or even fluorophore to make the nanoparticle fluorescence. And in addition to that, you can also add some other compounds at the surface. So they use these nanoparticles for different uh, therapeutic applications, from vaccines, mucosal vaccines, direct delivery, and um, in the recent years, they have been very good at making custom mRNA delivery that they are now actually doing vaccines and other kind of treatments with it. The questions when I came in, it was like, uh, okay, it works on the therapeutic level, but how can we further optimize the therapeutic applications? Um, one way to do it is actually to try to better understand what are the interactions of the nanoparticle of just the carrier with the organisms on, on its fate. So the, the main question was, okay, how, how do they behave in the blood, for example, if you inject it? Uh, what would happen? So we add red fluorescent uh, nanoparticles, or we can also have other colors, that we injected in uh, baby zebrafish into the circulations. And then we could actually just um, see with live imaging, okay, all the nanoparticle goes. So the first thing we did was with a sterile microscope, and you can see the nanoparticle here in magenta, and the endothelial cells in green, because this fish is transgenic, so all the endothelial cells express the green uh, GFP, green crescent. But you can see with the microscope, the resolution is not very good. It seems to mimic the circulation of the vascular system, but you can't really tell if it's associated, if it's inside you or no. So in this case, we went to the spinning disc confocal microscope. And as you can see here, with just a very nice blood vessel, the resolution is, uh, is at a new level. It's not comparable. So we then looked, actually we investigated, okay, uh, several hours after the injections, where would we see the nanoparticles? So in this image here, you have um, a maximum intensity projections when you would see the vein of the fish on right ear and artery. You can see all the nanoparticles in magenta, so it's associated to it, but then you can just open the stack and go with the optical section. And then you see that the nanoparticles are actually really inside the endothelial cells, not at the surface. Interestingly, so if you look there, the nanoparticle does not mix with the cytosol, which means they are restricted to the undercity compartment. And other things we could see is that in addition to be internalized by um, endothelial cells, we could spot some phagocytes in the lumen, also some of them having a tiny bit of GFP. We then wonder, okay, but uh, what's the dynamic of that? Uh, how long does it take for the nanoparticle to be internalized and cleared from the blood? So then we made live imaging, or we injected and immediately go to the microscope. And then you can see the nanoparticles circulating. And you see that by around 20 minutes, almost nothing remains in the blood circulation. So this is data we could confirm afterward with uh, electron microscopy. So we know a bit more what happened on the, 
on the vascular, on the endothelial cells side. But then, okay, so we seem to have some phagocytes in the blood. So we looked at neutrophils first um, with green for some neutrophils, and we didn't see anything. So then we looked at macrophages, and we used the transgenic line where macrophages are red fluorescent. So in this picture here, you have the vein right here on the artery right over there. The nanoparticles are in cyan, and the macrophages in red fluorescent. And we could recompose with MRIs all the 3D structures, all the 3D of the macrophages, and then you could open up and say, okay, here we have some macrophages. Say, yes, we see the nanoparticles, so let me internalize it. So what we know so far is that, okay, the nanoparticles are quickly internalized by endothelial cells on macrophages um, by 20, 30 minutes. So then we try to look, okay, but uh, what will happen over time? So we tried, instead of using live imaging, in this case, we we made like a section for the organism of the larvae. And we looked, okay, uh, here we stand for the nuclei in blue. We have the blood vessels in green and the nanoparticles in magenta. So all the sections to the left are transversal sections this way. So you can see the notochord, you can see the muscles, you have the aorta right here, the network of veins, and then those two rounds here they are the kidneys, and then you have the developing intestine on the yolk. Right to the right, all these are a longitudinal section through the, the major vein on artery. So basically what we see that the biodistribution looks very stable. Nothing really happened. The only thing we could see actually is that some clusterization of the nanoparticle around the nuclei, but also at the 24 hour time we could spot some phagocytes evenly loaded with nanoparticles that we were not seeing at the 30 minute or four hours site. Well, that was a bit in intriguing. So we look also the same thing with macrophages. So here we look at the main veins, and basically from 30 minutes, 30 minutes, four hours, and 24 hours, there is not really changes. Just the still inside macrophages, although it felt that uh, it still look like the 24 hours seems that uh, maybe that they, they may have a bit more, but that's yeah, maybe it's just a uh, feeling, nothing real. So we continued, um, I would not present all the data here, but we tried to look at say they go into the vasculature, but could they go into what we call off-target accumulation sites? I want them to go into the blood, but would they reach the brain, would they reach the liver and other organs? So here we looked at the brain and we could see that at 30 minutes on forwards, the nanoparticles are restricted to the endothelial cells. They do not cross the blood-brain barrier. While at 24 hours, most of them were still restricted to the endothelial cells, we also again started to see um, phagocytes heavily loaded with nanoparticles. Um, that was a bit strange, and also we could identify that those cells are macrophages, are microglia. So, okay, so we really seems to have something different with the macrophages over time. So then we tried to, to figure out, okay, what's the dynamic of internalization by the macrophages? So if we look between 30 minutes time point and 24 time some points uh, at the quantity of nanoparticles inside macrophages, well, we could actually see that although there is no more nanoparticles circulating at 30 minutes, the macrophages still internalize nanoparticles. And also we look by flow cytometry at the fraction of macrophages positive to nanoparticles. So you see like a slight increase from 10 minutes to 30 minutes, but at 30 minutes, nothing is circulating anymore, but still more and more macrophages get positive for the nanoparticles. So, okay, how do they, how do the macrophages internalize nanoparticles? They should not be available to them, like all of it is inside endothelial cells or already in macrophages. So for that, we went with uh, high resolution live imaging. So we're injecting nanoparticles into the, the circulations. And then we went to this little area of the zebrafish larvae called the yolk circulation valley because you already are, you have very, very thin tissues before the blood compartments. So it is ideal for high resolution imaging. So basically what is composed, you have like the epidermis, a small basement membrane, a layer of underfill cells, uh, the blood circulations on the yolk syncytial layer. And if we are to look in first on this is how it looks. So if you have in green, this layer of underfill cells, you have some nanoparticles in white on the macrophages in red. So you also a lot of macrophages. Um, during live imaging in this area, we could figure out at one point, acquired several set of videos where uh, it seemed that 
macro, some macrophages would go in contact up very close to the endothelium, and at one point, we would see a transfer of, uh, of GFP and nanoparticle from the endothelial cells to the macrophage. But I think you would see it better in the small videos to the right. It would be this macrophage here. So see, it starts to go in contact, click close down, close down, and one point here, there, it takes up a chunk of GFP on nanoparticles. So quickly, uh, we look into the into the stack of the videos and say, okay, at the moment it's internalized the nanoparticles, the, the GFP. There's already nanoparticles in the GFP. So they get a chunk of the endothelial cells, apparently, with nanoparticle inside. But that the nanoparticle inside are still inside endothelial compartments. And we looked a bit after and say, okay, then the microphage match everything. You see the GFP signal getting lower because it is being quenched by the acidity of the compartment, while some GFP seems to be expelled by the cell. So they say like that was very unexpected. Um, it seemed that just microphage could just like new bits of microphages of uh, of endothelial cells, and we didn't know this mechanism. It was never reported before. So basically, what we what we reported in this publication, like okay, we don't really know what happened there. Exactly, but we know that at the end you have the macrophages that internalize in another city compartment GFP that does not match with the three or four inside the cytosol of the macrophage with the red, and that you have the nanoparticle inside this other city compartment. So if we look into the mechanistic, then it excludes everything which is exocytosis related. Okay, so what could transfer other city compartments? I think tuning nanotubes could do it. But in this case, you would have a direct transfer on mix of the two fluorophores, so that does not work out. Mm, well, it could be maybe it was um, apoptosis-related events, like maybe there was ethylosomes from a dying endothelial cell. I say like, yeah, the problem is the donor cell in the videos we, we have, they stay alive, they don't die, and there's no dying cells around. And then when we looked um, at the cell that induced by the injection of nanoparticles, uh, beside the, mechan the mechanical injury of injecting, you don't see anything. So it's unlikely to be uh, apoptosis related. But we think, uh, what we have to prove that is that it might be related uh, to trogocytosis. Well, initially, trogocytosis was described uh, by exchange of plasma membrane between, neutrophils, by, between uh, lymphocytes. Uh, but the thing is, uh, no people started to look into macrophages, and it seemed that in macrophages they can neos, especially with adipocytes, a chunk of adipocytes, um, the transfer material is then internalized instead of remaining at the plasma membrane. So still, the, the identification of this mechanism is the topic of further studies, but still like, very interesting because it seems that you have the mechanisms that were not expected for the um, for the nanoparticles. And it's very important to try to understand, okay, oh, it works because maybe we could explode it for therapeutic applications. For example, to target nanoparticles to the brain macrophages or microglia, which are usually involved in a neurodegener neurodegenerative disease. So that was quite interesting. And then uh, we tried to look also uh, at these at this old pathways um, on disease models. So for example, uh, on cancer, we show here with this publication we published last year, uh, we can actually infect uh, zebrafish larvae with cancer cells, melanoma cells you see in uh, orange in right here. And we see that when we do that, we have a glorious um, angiogenesis, I presume even more, you see here. And in blue, you have quantum dots, just to show that all these vessels are functional. And of course, we also look into uh, the granuloma, the tuberculosis models. But unfortunately, there is no time to present all this. Uh, so that's the follow part about light imaging, and now we start to go a bit more into the, the whole organism observations. So basically, in this case, it's more about the adult zebrafish. So basically, something I do um, for my research is I will make cryo sections through the length of the zebrafish, so you see here with coronal section, and you see that in the block, everything is preserved. We have the ovaries, the intestines, the, the gills, here you have the egg the tail, if you have the art, so everything would be preserved. And then you can uh, make some kind of different staining, for example, uh, with phalloidin to reveal all the actins. 
armed to that it for the nuclei. On just those two, uh, the pattern of actin staining on, nu on nuclei will give you a lot of information to identify which tissue you're in and which cell type you're looking at. And in this case, in the acquisition to the right here, uh, the endothelial cells, the blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and junctions are in green uh, fluorescence. And then I'll just follow the videos. You can see uh, from this 3D multiple field of view acquisition that you have access, you can identify the kidneys and the tubules. Then you can navigate a bit more, and then you can see here this membrane that separates with the liver with melanocyte in black. Then you have all the sinusoids of the liver. And you can see actually with all this vasculature why it is very dangerous to get injury in the liver. It's, uh, it's mostly blood vessels on hepatocytes. There you can see the ultimo branchial gland. And then you just continue. Then you have some muscles. You will have some bones here, for example. And then you can follow the oesophagus on all this vasculature. And then if you look there, then you would have a nerve that is also preserved, a blood vessel and the anastomotic vessels around it. So to, to be able to make real sections, to stain it, and to, uh, to then use the dragonfly to, to make very fast acquisitions of multiple field of view, uh, it's, it's very nice to explore the right areas. And it's very good to, to look at, say, like just blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, immune system, bones, everything. So here I would, for example, show you. So here we have a fish that is infected with a parasite, fungi, uh, called uh, Microsporidia neurophilia. In fact, the most preferential sites are the hind brain and the spinal cord. So here you have a coronal section through the fish that is made of 105 field of view of a thickness of 8 microns. So just to say, this huge data took one hour to acquire with estimating this. So I can't imagine how long it would have been with a conventional microscope. And then you can see the eyes, of course. Then you have the nostrils to the two sides. When you see there, actually, the nerves, the olfactory belt, the ventral parts of the telencephalon, the midbrain and the optic tectums right here. Then you go to the hindbrain. Right here, you have vertebra, and then you have the spinal cord. And right here, are all the muscles. And when you then display the immune cells, this is what happens. So of course, you see T cells uh, in the mucosal tissues, the cornea, the nostrils. But then you see all the aggregates to the hind brain and close to the spinal cord. So this you would not see in a healthy fish. So really, they are associated with these parasite infections. But I think the best thing is, again, to illustrate it with a video just to see what resolution you can the resolution you achieve with such imaging. So here we focus over the nostrils, and you can see all the T cells, individual cells. And then you can move around, go into the olfactory bulb. Yeah, there it is, with Star Wars mode. And you can continue, and then you can see all the difference between the different regions of the brain. You can see all these um, red cells that you will not see in the forward regions. Then you have the optic tectum, you see some T cells. In the meninges, this is the ear of the fish. Again, with a bit of T cells, some nerves. You can see all the vasculature in the, in the muscles, only vascularized. And then again, the video will focus um, on the parts which are infected by this parasite. Here you can see all these parts here that are full of parasites. And what you see here is full of spores. And again, if you continue, you will pass the vertebrae right here. And then you continue to the spinal cord. And then you can also see sac of spores here on all the T cells around. So this is really like triggers uh, infiltration of immune cells in the brain. So you have to be careful when you do uh, neurosciences to not have your fish infected with these parasites. Okay, so no, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a few one of the video I forgot about it. So yeah, okay, we could also spot some local uh, infiltrations of lymphocytes in the brain right here. So okay, now let's go to, to the past, say one of my 
research topic is to look actually into the immune system of the fish on its organization. So yes, the zebrafish model is heavily used to study immunity, fish and human pathologies, immune mechanisms. But still, um, th there is still a huge need to better understand the anatomical organization of the adult zebrafish immune system. And if I were to summarize a bit, so here you have a very nice zebrafish, and you have the head with the dorsal cavity, and then you would have the kidneys, thymus, and spleen. So there is two uh, primary input organs, the thymus on the kidney marrow. Kidney marrow, this is where you have the hematopoiesis. But the kidney marrow is also a site of, um, has also a function of secondary lymphoid tissue, which also have the spleen. Then, of course, uh, we can consider that the fish is a huge mucosa because all its interface with the environment is made of mucosal tissues. So you have um, lymphoid tissue associated to those mucosa, like in the nostrils, the gills, the guts, and the skin. And of course, you can uh, have inductive uh, structures such as melanomacrophage centers on granulomas. The thing is, if you look into these mucosal tissues, um, what is perceived wrongly is that it's just like diffuse and organized or scattered immune cells in those mucosal tissue, which is a bit odd thinking when you think about the fish in its natural habitat, even exposed to pathogens. You would expect the mucosal tissue to be a bit more sophisticated. On the tree, there have been some more structured, now that are being um, more structured lymphoid tissue that are now being discovered. That will go a bit. So, but my main area of interest is the bronchial cavity. So basically, if you look at the fish from, from the back, you would see the pharynx in green, for example, in the middle, and the bunch of cavity would make two cavities on each side, and then you would have four pairs of gill arches. The water would be breathed through the mouth, goes into the pharynx, reach each bronchial cavity, irrigate the gills, and be expelled by openings. If we look at what gills actually look like, so well, here I change a bit because this is gills from salmon. It's a bit bigger, it's a bit easy to, a bit more easy to, uh, to show and uh, explain all the gill arch structures. So basically, at the bottom, you have a supportive structure called the gill arch, the cartilaginous. And then from this gill arch, you have some kind of trees that arise on each side. So if you make transversal section for this, you see like the gill arch, and then you have these two trees called filament. And that in between the filaments, you have another supportive structure it's called the septum. And when I spoke about having um, structured lymphoid tissue, here you have one actually that has been found in Norway in Salmon first, and that we recently showed existed in, in zebrafish as well. It's called the interbranchial lymphoid tissue, that we just call ILT, that is on top of the septum, on along the inner side of the filament. Of course, if we look, we want to look into zebrafish. So this is zebrafish gills. So here you have a bit of the pharynx in the middle, then you can recognize the gill arch. So this little spine here are called gills racker, they are to prevent foot, bigger foot particles to, to be into the gills. Then you have these small trees called filament. And then you see that these little flaps to the side, they're called lamellae, and this is where the gas exchange occurs. And if we were to, to make, uh, again, a transversal section for the gills, because when this study one wanted to, to look at the organization of the zebrafish gill associated lymphoid tissue, so we take uh, this kind of uh, imaging, and again, we have paludine in green and that in blue, and we have all T cells in red. And if we take into consideration the labeling of T cells and the compartmentalization of the gills, we could find that the GALT was, uh, could be uh, divided in five sections. One is this interventional lymphoid tissue you see on top of the septum right here, so on top of it, on the, on, in the side of the filament. Then there is three regions, like in the other part of the filament, on the, the bronchial arc. Uh, there, the T cells are just scattered, but then something interesting is we could see on the sides, each side of the gill arch, right here on the air, at the base of the filament, something that looks a bit more clustered. So it's a new lymphoid tissue that we found and called the antibranchial lymphoid tissue, or ALT in short. So we tried to characterize that a bit more, and you can see with a first zoom, so you have two different gill arch, you can see very well the scattered T cells on the gill arch, and then when you reach to this place, you see that the T cells are a lot more clustered. 
So then we wonder, okay, so but this is just some kind of loose tissue, loose aggregate of T cells, or is it structured? So what we did is we labeled um, cytokeratin because uh, cytokeratin will then reveal the reticulated epithelial cells that you usually find in structured lymphoid tissue. So you find them in the ILT, uh, which was shown in salmon, and in this new lymphoid tissue, the ALT, we could find that it was the same. So this is this seems to be like a structured lymphoid tissue. So if we look at this small scheme, so basically we have the gill arch, the two filaments, lamella A, ALT, and then you would have on the two sides the ALT. But still we wonder, uh, is it some, some kind of aggregate that we find sometimes, or is it continuous for the whole length of the of the gill arch? So in this case, I had to dissect very carefully to not damage the gills, which are very fragile, and make one month staining with that T. And then again, that I acquired with the dragon pie, and you can see that uh, this is continuous. You see everything there, all the T cells in white were continuous. So you can see all the gill records, the gill arch, the filaments on the flaps. There you have the T cells. You see it continuous. This is the ALT. I'll just let you enjoy the videos just to see, to look at the 3D of the gill arch. Then we could see that, you see, it goes on along the side, but then it makes small penetrations in between the filaments. So it seems also to zigzag a bit in between the filaments, which is quite, in, quite interesting. And as you can see, that the resolution is very, very good. On um, this, uh, is very quick to acquire. I think it takes maybe like five, eight minutes maximum for three different colors. So then, so we could find actually the, the organization of the gill associated uh, lymphoid tissue, find a new structured lymphoid tissue in it. And then we wonder, okay, but uh, what if we actually uh, change the level and should look at the whole bronchial cavity level. So there, actually, we did the same thing as I showed you in the previous videos. We have these um, multiple field of view acquisitions on transversal section through the bronchial cavity. And as you can see, on the roof of the bronchial cavity, you have the thymus. Here you have the T cells are in white, the actin is in green, and nuclei in blue. And as you can see, we could see that there was some kind of continuity of the T cell staining from the thymus to the gill, you can see that most of the parts in the bronchial cavity were interconnected together. But the main surprise that we got is when we then started to look at the lower parts of the bronchial cavity, we actually could find a new lymphoid organ that we call the Nemosian lymphoid organ. So if we just look in this image, the T cells are in red, phalloidine in green, and DAPI in blue. You, you have the two bronchial cavity. You have the gill arches, one and two, one and two. Then you have the uroial bone right here. And then we see all these structures heavily loaded with T cells, actually in the, in the isthmus, in the part between the two bronchial cavity that connect. And we could see that in many different places. So, of course, we characterize that um, a lot more on the paper. It's uh, very close to submission now. Uh, but we could use that, for example, and with the collaboration with Montpellier that make layer by layer imaging focal microscope merged with the bristles. Uh, we could actually recompose the 3D structure of this new organ. So this is how the Nemosian liquid organ looks. Actually, if you were to replace with the heads of the fish on the bronchial cavity, so here you have the two timers on top. This is the localization right in the middle of this new lymphoid organ. So you can see. The zebrafish just allowed us with live imaging to find new uh, biological mechanisms um, regarding nanoparticles. And then just to explore the immune system of the fish, we could find new lymphoid structures on new lymphoid organs. So I would like to thank uh, well, you for, at uh, for attending this, this show and also uh, to acknowledge uh, Garrett Griffiths my PI to allow me to have the, the freedom to do the research that, that I like, all the different collaborators involved in the different projects, and of course, um, on the and Lagroot staff, as well as the, the, the imaging facility, Normic, that I've been using, and from which I get a great support. So, yeah.
Uh, if you have any questions, so the question and answer sessions will be at the end of the of the talk of Claudia. And yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Claudia. So yeah, it's all yours. So thank you very much, Julianne, and thank you so much for your excellent presentation. I did enjoy it quite a lot, seeing multiple uses of the zebrafish. And now I will follow up with a very quick overview of the dragonfly, which was the microscope that Julian used to do most of his uh, a very nice microscopy data. So as you saw from Julian's presentation, there's a extremely, it is extremely important to integrate the cells, also the nanostructures within the cells, and to integrate all that information in the whole organism. And we at Andor, we do believe that we have the perfect system that allows you to analyze the nano information, the structures on the cells, and also the whole organism. So starting by comparing the dragonfly with multi-point, with single point scanning confocals. So as you can see immediately in this image, when you're using point scanning confocals, the image is scanned point by point by point. And the dragonfly, due to its multi-point confocal technology, will deliver an image in an instant. And that's why we say we have an instant confocal. Also, because of its dual microlens system, we have high efficiency in capturing the light. Not only that, but the Dragonfly benefits from Andor's EMCCDs and SCMOS technology, which delivers quantum efficiencies up to 90%, whereas point scanning confocals, the quantum efficiencies are around 45%. So you, we have better efficiency in capturing the light. So as an overall key specification of the Dragonfly, we deliver a very fast confocal with speeds in confocal mode up to 400 frames per second. It has a very wide field of view with a 22 millimeter diagonal. So this will increase your productivity because you need to acquire less images to have this uh, larger fields of view. And we deliver a very wide uh, excitation range of wavelengths from the 405 nearly 800 nanometers excitation and it has a very flat, uniform spectrum across the whole excitation wavelength. And our detector delivers 16 bit gray levels, nearly six, more than 65,000 gray levels. So the Dragonfly multipoint confocal is what we say a multimodal, high contrast multimodal platform. As I just told you, it is a confocal, an instant confocal, multipoint confocal. But you can also use the Dragonfly to have laser wide field imaging, or you can also have super resolution techniques such as this storm and surf stream, or even you can use the Dragonfly for turf imaging. And all of this in a single imaging system. As I just told you, you have from visible to the near infrared wavelengths with the Dragonfly. And now I will pass to show you some imaging applications that you can use with the Dragonfly. So you, the, you can use the Dragonfly for deep imaging applications and you can image up to millimeters deep in tissues or you can image deep in tissues and simultaneously acquire live imaging data or acquire live imaging data and simultaneously acquire double color labeling. And if you combine it with search stream, you can acquire super resolution images, images that break the diffraction limit of light far beyond the edge of the cover slip. So one example of this is this clear tissue that it's 2.4 millimeter depth imaged with the Andor Dragonfly. And because we, we deliver a very broad uniform illumination spectrum due to our Borealis patent illumination delivery, you can see that with some systems you can actually see the image, the tiles when you do the image, but using the Borealis perfect illumination, you don't see the tiles. So you have seamless stitching, perfect illumination across the whole field of view. 
And what does this do? Is that if you want to image a full fish, as Julian was just saying, imaging the zebrafish, but in this case, for example, I could be interested in the eye, in imaging the details on the eye, but I also want to see the whole fish. So I can acquire with a high magnification lens and I can acquire multiple tiles because the system is quite fast and I have the detail at every scale from the nanometer till the millimeter. And for example, in this case where we image the neurons and this is in the mouse brain tissue and you can see this was more than 5,500 images acquired in 25, image, 25 minutes. So you have montage and montage with deep imaging and you can see the neuron and the neuron integrated with its neighboring cells. Moving on to live imaging. In live imaging, challenges, the greatest challenges actually is to avoid phototoxicity because in the end of the movie, you want to have the cells alive and you don't want that which what you are seeing is effect due to degradation and due to too much light. But also, when you go over the phototoxicity, you also want to avoid photobleaching because in the end of the movie, you still want to have signal enough in, in order to be able to analyze your data. And ma many times, uh, researchers need to compromise, need to decrease the light, need to decrease the temporal resolution or the spatial resolution. But because we deliver a system that is extremely gentle in imaging and is extremely efficient in capturing the light, we do believe that with the Dragonfly, you don't need to compromise. And so I will show you some examples. As for here, we were imaging uh, live inside the intestine, imaging deep the blood flow, and this was acquired at 200 frames per second with Andor SCMOS camera, and you can actually see the blood flow. If you want to break the resolution limit, you can use SurfStream. SurfStream uh, yields an increase in resolution between two to six times in the final data. And due to its low power requirements, it is compatible with live cell imaging. And SurfStream algorithm allows acquisition of super resolved images deep inside the cells and tissues. And you can compare here the same fixed cells in this case, where I wanted to show the improvement in resolution from no surf to, to a surf stream image. Another application that you can use the Dragonfly for is multiplex imaging or spatial result transcriptomics. Spatial result transcriptomics or multiplex imaging are, is a group of methods that deliver information at a single molecule RNA level of expression of numerous genes. So these methods are extremely important because they allow the discovery of new biomarkers, identify new cell types in responses to diseases and injuries. They can reveal an atlas of gene expression of a, a 2D or 3D tissue, and they can identify uh, temporal and spatial gene expression patterns. And how this is done? Well, this is done integrating the Dragonfly imaging system with a microfluidic devices. And imaging your cells, imaging your sample, doing barcodes and doing multiple rounds of a hybridization and stripping, and then with the Dragonfly ultra-fast imaging system, doing multiple rounds and you do have rounds enough to deliver the number of genes products that you want to analyze. We do offer at Andor a full complete imaging system from acquisition to analysis. And upon acquiring your imaging data, you can go to Imari's workstation and analyze your imaging data. And in this case, for example, trace your vessels. So the Dragonfly comes in two models. We do offer the Dragonfly 500 and the Dragonfly 200. The Dragonfly 500 is the complete imaging system in which you have all the, the imaging modalities as turf, the super resolution. And also it can be combined with Andor's photostimulation devices. For example, if you combine it with Mosaic for optogenetics to analyze in cancer research, cell proliferation and cell invasion, or in neurosciences, for example, you can use turf to analyze neural cone uh, dynamics and forming connections. 
The Dragonfly 200 is offered as a more compact solution and is offered in an upright and inverted uh, systems. You can use it for developmental biology studies. For example, you can also combine it with other photostimulation devices such as Micropoint for laser ablation. You can use it for cardiovascular studies, for vascular damage and repair. Again, you can combine it with other photostimulation devices or for neurosciences. These are very versatile uh, devices, that, uh, microscopes that you can use for multiple applications. And this is just an example of multiple publications that have been used with Dragonfly. So with the Dragonfly, we are very proud to say that researchers like Julian do publish science that in high impact journals. And we are extremely proud to deliver and to help those researchers to push science further. And with this, I will uh, finish and I'm happy to take Thank any questions. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Vesigir and Dr. Florindo for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, uh, very impressive imaging. Can this also be extended to study pathogens? Uh, 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 very good questions. Um, I mean, definitely, uh, there's a lot of lab now that are using the zebrafish to study host pathogen interaction, the state from different viruses, different bacteria, parasites. I uh, say so even the, the coronavirus, there is no preprint uh, that are available. So I think that the paper will be published very soon. So it, it is, yes, a very good system to study uh, pathogens and diseases. Okay, our next question is, let's see, where did it go? <laughs> um, great talk. I have two questions. One, can you target the nanoparticles to a specific type of cell and deliver drugs specifically to, let's say, peripheral neurons? And two, what software imaging system was used for the T-cell infiltration after viral infection video? Well, um, thank you for the, the compliment. Uh, regarding the targeting of nanoparticles, uh, that's a bit of a tricky question because um, it really depends on which way you want to administer the, the nanoparticles, how long you want them to impact, and also which part of the body. And for peripheral neurons, uh, then you have to think, if you inject it intravenously, you have to think of a strategy so that they would cross the, the blood, the endotheliums, the basement membrane, and then reach uh, these personal neurons. Uh, I think that's um, yeah, that's very tricky to answer. Um, I will go to the second uh, part of the question. So I think you refer to the to the very large brain images with the infection of the uh, uh, microspoidia neurophilia. So for that, the, the software was Imaris, and um, well, you make the videos with Imaris and you try to crop to work with it, and then you can end up, end up a bit with uh, imagery. But um, just to, to say, this set of image was more than 100 gigabytes, so you need also a very good uh, computer to be able to, uh, to work on it. Thank you, Julian. And we have another question here. Uh, we have been using zebrafish larvae larva for mycobacterial infections. Any idea if the nanoparticle imaging can be used for bacterial infections? Uh, yes, actually. Um, well, some data I did not present, but uh, we also work on uh, delivering new therapeutic compounds to um, granuloma, tuberculosis granuloma. So uh, definitely you, you can do that. And actually the, the laboratory of Gary Griffith has been publishing two papers uh, two recent papers, one that showed that macrophages could internalize nanoparticles and migrate to the site of uh, mycobacterium granuloma. And also that if you inject it intravenously, they would also accumulate uh, at the granuloma site over time. So let you, you can check the literature of Garrett Griffiths and you'll find those two papers. Dr. Florindo, would you have anything that you would like to add? 
Okay, I'm not sure if I can hear Dr. Florindo, but we will definitely come back to you if you have anything that you need to say. Uh, I will move on to the next question. Um, stunning pictures. I am working on an osteoporosis. Is that you, Dr. Florindo? No. No, okay. I am working on oste an osteoporosis model of zebrafish. What is your recommendation uh, imaging technologies for drug screening using scale? Oh, I would go for, well, uh, scale are quite thin in zebrafish, so you should be able to do 3D imaging um, using the dragonfly very well. Uh, you could also use some, uh, well, I don't need, I don't think you need to go with the light sheet. I think it's not um, big enough, but that could also be uh, a possibility. But then uh, if you were to use just regular bones for osteoporosis, like all this 3D imaging, if you take the fish, you fix it, and you're protected, and uh, decalcify it with EDTA, uh, you can also do these uh, wall organism sections and try to look over a different set of bones, all the impacts of the different drugs. I hope that answers you, your question. Okay, thank you, Julian. Um, Dr. Florindo, are you are you still there? I I am still here. Can you listen to me? I can hear no. you now. Yes, oh, yes. Finally. <laughs> if there's something that you would like to say that we passed over, please go ahead and say that. Yeah, I was uh, when uh, uh, Julianne was talking about uh, the Imarish, so I was just wanting to say that uh, we do offer with the Dragonfly that Julianne used for acquisition. We do offer an end-to-end -end solution, and Imarish comes integrated with the Dragonfly system for analysis and creating those near-term movies that you have been seeing in the presentation. And sorry for the technical problems. <laughs> That's okay. I think we're all kind of used to technical problems now with this year of being on Zoom and webinars. And so we, I think we all understand. I'm so glad you got a chance to speak. Uh, okay, so let me uh, ask one another question here. We may have time for just a few more. Uh, can we get XYZ coordinates information from Dragonfly? Uh, uh, yes, so the, the Dragonfly is a multimodal system that is delivered by and or technology. And you have a two, uh, uh, it's a multi-point spinning disk confocal. So it is a confocal imaging system, but it also delivers other imaging uh, technologies. So you can do uh, uh, confocal, you can do wide field imaging, you can do surf stream with a dragonfly, you can do turf, and you can do a, a storm and 3D storm. We do have two different types of the dragonfly, dragonfly 500, and 200. Uh, so if you want to have uh, more information with the Dragonfly, we'll be happy to come back to you uh, offline uh, with the uh, Andor technologies. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Claudia. We've got another qu last question. I think this is also for you. Uh, for multiplex imaging, how is the interaction between the Dragonfly and the external devices achieved? So for, uh, thank you so much for that question. And uh, for the multiplex imaging, the, the interaction is done by the REST API interface, which is incorporated into the Fusion software. So uh, it can, the, the external devices can be controlled by uh, an external program that can be driven by Python, LabVIEW, or MATLAB. And this provides the ability for Fusion to communicate uh, with the, for Dragonfly to the, communicate with the microfluidic devices through Fusion and to proceed to the multiple rounds of imaging and, uh, and, um, and washing, uh, integrating with the microfluidic system. Thank you, uh, Dr. Resigier and Dr. Florindo. Do you have any final comments for our audience today? So, Julia, please go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, well, thanks for uh, attending the, the webinar. Uh, also, thanks a lot uh, to Dr. Florando uh, for the invitations to perform this seminar. Uh, I hope that uh, after these uh, presentations, you would be convinced of how powerful is the zebrafish model for live imaging. 
um, that um, you would also consider uh, all the great improvements that have been done on the spinning distance between microscopes on that, all the things that you can achieve with it. So, yeah, that was my final words. So, as for my final words, the first big thank you I would like to give is for Dr. Julien, who was kind enough to present his work and these awesome images. And, uh, and thank you, Arud, for uh, giving us the chance to present our system. And I would like to say to every, everyone that we do have uh, an outstanding imaging system, a spinning disc confocal microscope that allows us to acquire confocal images quite fast and deliver uh, explained uh, resolution. So please contact Andor if you want to know more about the Dragonfly. And this is all from my side. Thank you again, Dr. Vesigir and Dr. Florindo for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Andor, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>